We are live. Vroom. Playing with my little brave toy there. Welcome to our Go Live. My name is Dave Solberg, Managing Editor of the RV Repair Club, and we are going to spend the next hour answering your questions. Um, hopefully we, we don't get the real challenging ones, but we'll, we'll handle any ones we get coming in. So uh, the first thing I do want to say is that uh, we did just finished up doing a blog. For those of you that are CoachNet members, um, in just about every new RV purchase today gets a free CoachNet uh, membership for the first year. Great organization, but we did a uh, couple blogs that are going to be posted here on tips for camping in the wintertime. Uh, I've spent a couple of uh, uh, winters traveling throughout the country. Uh, I actually went to Alaska in 1978, and um, my first big camping trip was going into Mount McKinley on uh, Thanksgiving weekend, and we had a very cold weekend, and we learned quite a bit on that one. So uh, my idea of roughing it has changed a little bit from, from that point on. But check out that CoachNet blog if you are doing any type of camping in the wintertime. Um, some great tips on how to keep warm, and we'll cover some of that a little bit later if we run out of questions. So with that, uh, I think Angie's got some questions that came from Sam and uh, our viewers out there. So why don't we start with the first one? Okay, so the first question asks... All right. I wish you could see Angie's face when she's getting this. <laughs> she's got it very animated. All right, someone asked... What is the best way to test house batteries? Can you do it without disconnecting all the batteries? That is a very complex question because the, the house batteries are deep cycle batteries. Um, you either have the lead acid batteries or you may have um, AGMs, which are absorbed glass mat. Uh, some of them do lithium ion right now, but let's, let's take the, the lead acid, for example. Um, the, you've got plates inside the battery and they're covered with an acid uh, liquid and as you charge that, the battery is simply a storage vehicle. All it's going to do is store energy. So when your charger pulls that, puts that energy into the battery, um, those plates, when it starts to draw down, are going to get sulfur over those plates. And the, the thicker the sulfur, the more you get in it, uh, the less it's going to be able to store that. Now, you, be, you can charge that battery up to 12.6 volts and then take it into somebody and have it tested. And they'll tell you the battery's good, but then you go out and try to use it, and you're supposed to get 80 to 100 amp hours out of it, and you get 50 just because those plates have been saturated with that, that sulfation or sulfur on it. The only way you can truly test the condition of your batteries and how, how sulfated they are, how well they'll store, is to properly charge them with a multi-stage charger. And this is something that a lot of people don't realize with batteries, lead acid batteries, is once a month you need to do that multi-stage charge. So you need to hit about 14.6 to 16 volts. It starts to boil that liquid that's in there, that acid. It breaks up that sulfur. And then it goes into an equalizing and a float charge. And if you have a typical converter like this one back here, this one happens to be a, an average converter with a, a distribution center with a converter on the side, and that's simply a battery charger. All that does is recognize your batteries go down to 10.6 uh, volts. It throws in 13.6 till that battery gets up to 12.6 and it shuts off. If you were to put a gauge on that or a multimeter or anything, it'd say 12.6, and a lot of your service centers are going to say, yeah, the batteries are good. Um, you know, you even put on the ones that have the, the load um, sensor on them where you, you put the uh, charger on and hit the load and it shows, yep, they, they look good. Well, they look good because they're charged right at that current time. The only way you can tell, and, and let me back up a little bit, um, you know, the only way to get a multi-stage charge is if you have a large inverter that has that multi-stage charge or you have a solar panel with a control module that'll do the same thing at conditioning. Or there are some companies now that instead of just this conventional converter, they have a, a conditioning or a desulfation converter. Um, Progressive Dynamics is one that has a charge wizard and a couple of the converters that will do that. You can also use a battery minder um, that you can get from Northern Tool. Now the only way to truly, so sorry for the long answer to this question, but the only way to truly tell what condition your batteries are in is to charge them with a multi-stage charger, 
uh, let them sit top, uh, top, they basically call them uh, stage for about an hour and then hook a 25 amp, um, it's a 25 amp draw machine to that. And I spent a lot of time with Lifeline and Trojan and others out there um, asking that same question and they've got these machines at their distribution centers and they simply put that on and they time it and they, they know exactly if it's supposed to go 80 to 100 amp hours and they put that on there it goes 50 you only have 50 percent of that battery capacity so there, there are some digital chargers that you can you can get you do not have to take the batteries out um, a lot of times if you would go into uh, either an RV service center or even sometimes your parts stores such as uh, AutoZone and O'Reilly's make sure they understand deep cycle batteries um, but again I, I would say that typically um, over 75 percent of the batteries out in the market that do not have the multi-stage charger are going to be sulfated past 50 percent of their life. Don asked, do you know if they make storm windows for the screen door so you can keep the door open if you have the AC or heat on? Store, well, there are a variety of different, it, it, I guess it depends on the type of unit you have and the door you have. Um, you know, I know Winnebago Industries makes their own door and their own screen door, and they do not have a storm door that's designed for that one. Uh, Lippert is another company that is making a lot of the doors out in the industry, industry right now, and they have come out with a few uh, of the storm doors that are available. Um, another one we just ran into here recently is Irvine uh, Shade and Doors out in California, and um, uh, actually they were they were at the Pomona show with a display, and we're getting some some of the roller shades and side blinds for a project that we're working on. But they do have doors as well, and I did see that they had some storm door options. I didn't go too far into it, but check out Irvine Door uh, Shade and Door Company. Uh, check out Lippert, uh, but something else that you could do, I think that would, would probably work um, fairly well is I would assume that right now you have a typical screen door. That one doesn't have one. It's, um, or a typical door that's insulated, and then you've got a screen door that's probably just an aluminum frame with a uh, screen and a mesh or um, aluminum bracket in the center of it more screen at the bottom. I have seen a lot of people that have just had a plexiglass piece cut for that and added to that thin enough so that they can apply it and still get the door shut without too much room, uh, but yet it does provide some protection from cold and heat um, coming in and out. So that's something you probably make your own. Eric asked, I have a 2004 18 foot cruiser RV with fiberglass walls have removed the graphics, but the exterior exterior is oxidized and really needs painting. Do you know how to find a reputable repair shop and any idea on cost? Um, cost is all over the board because there's some people that will do it for $75 an hour and you get into the bigger cities and they're $175. Um, just about any body shop should be able to paint that because it's, it's a typical Phylon um, Chemlite fiberglass outer skin. Uh, you said 2004, is that right? Yep. So probably back, Chemlite is now Crane and so forth. Um, it, it all depends on the, the level of, of uh, exterior gel coat. So the way that fiberglass panel is manufactured is they have it in the great big sheets and they put the fiberglass, um, chopped fiberglass with the resin in it. And then the last stage is clear coat and they call it gel coat. The more clear coat you have on that, the shinier it gets, the more it looks automotive, the less hair cell or grain you see of the actual fiber. So you just need to find somebody that can buff off that gel coat, get it down to a paintable surface. Um, one of the things I would suggest trying if it's oxidizing right now is just take a little sample, go get some barkeeper's friend. It, it's in the grocery stores, um, you know, over by the Comet and, and Drain and Comet and, and uh, other cleaners like that. Get the liquid form and just use a buffer wheel, 3M makes the best one with the foam, and just take a, a small little sample area. Now, one of the uh, classes that we did is the exterior care and maintenance class, and we showed that procedure in that class on a uh, 2002 Winnebago 
adventure. This thing is a unit that had sat out in California and it was horrible sidewall. Um, all the decals were cracked really, really bad. We didn't get into that, but we, we did do some samples of two or three different components. We had rubbing compound, polishing compound, and then this barkeeper's friend, and it, and it, it worked very, very well. Um, you might be past the point of being able to restore it and, and put a wax back on it, uh, plus it's an awful lot of work. To repaint um, an 18-foot, I know we, uh, we got a quote on this 34-foot Brave, and it was $10,000 to repaint the Brave. But that's, that was full body paint, um, you know, with some graphic design into it. So if you got an 18-foot unit, um, you know, you might, and I'm, I'm guessing, it, it all depends on, it's all labor, basically. So how much labor is it going to take to prep that thing and get it to a point where they can paint it, get off all that powdery exterior oxidation? How much prep work is there to get any of the decals that you took off? There's probably uh, gum marks, ridges in those that need to be prepped. The windows, you know, um, in an 18 footer, probably not that much. And maybe it's something that the more you can do, the less they'll have to do. Yeah, but check with the body shop. Anybody that's familiar with any kind of fiberglass, you know, most of the Corvettes were made out of fiberglass, all that type of stuff, they should be able to, to, to do that. Next question. Uh, do you know of any company that sells shutters for an RV? Shutters. Hmm. I would, uh, you know, I'd start with Lippert. Um, no, Lippert does a whole bunch of, of stuff, and I don't know um, if it's exterior shutters. I have not, uh, I've not seen that. But I would also look at the Irvine um, Shade and Door Company. Otherwise, you probably are, are looking at, you know, if, if it's the typical house shutters that you're looking just to be able to cover the windows when you get some inclement weather coming in, um, I would say you're probably going to have to find some company that would customize those. And I know there's a lot out there that um, I, I did a lot of research. We put shutters on our house. And they're decorative shutters, but I did a lot of research on the different styles and stuff and ended up, ended up building my own um, on those, but uh, that's because we wanted to go with a maple that matched, anyway, other stuff. So <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let you talk to my wife about that. Anyway, uh, I did see a lot of companies that will make plastic shutters and they've got customized sizes, so you might be able to just Google search and see what do you need. Get your dimensions. Um, you don't want something too heavy. Will a load leveler help me to tow a little bit more than recommended? My van limit is 3,500 pounds, and the travel trailer I want to get is 3,250 pounds. With water and other belongings, the trailer will max out to about 3,700 pounds. Yeah. There, there's nothing you can add to a trailer tongue hitch equalizing distribution airbags to the the suspension system that will allow you to pull any more in a vehicle and I see that a lot where somebody says well, I'm gonna put air springs in this and I've got you know all these extra stuff it all has to do with the 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 back axle it has to do with the braking capabilities it has to do with so many components there's there's nothing you can add to that plus you need to take 10 percent off of what your carrying capacity or your towing capacity is in your vehicle. Uh, you don't want to be at maximum weight if you're going down a mountain, if you're driving in hot weather, um, icy or even just wet roads. Even if you have trailer assist, you, you need to take 10% off as a safety factor. So your 3,400 now becomes 340 less than that. You start putting that thing up into 36, 3,700 pounds, you're asking for problems. One of the things you can do is do not take water with you. Water weighs 8.3 pounds per gallon. So there's no reason to take water and throw in another 100, 200, 300 pounds in that thing. Once you get to the campground, you fill it up. This is all about traveling down the road, being able to stop, not wearing out to components in there. So, um, you know, I would look for ways of lightening that trailer up. Um, you know, there, I've seen where people have come in and said, okay, I don't need two beds, I don't need a couch, I'm going to put two lightweight chairs in there. Um, there are floor plans that you know, are exactly like that 
floor plan you're looking at. I've run into this many, many times with people that have um, smaller little cars, even hybrids. Uh, there's not a lot of trailers for hybrids, but there's some pop-ups and, and stuff. But I've seen a lot of people with 3,500 pound towing capacity that we've been able to find a floor plan in like R-Pod, Jayco. Um, they've got some really nice lightweight units that are coming in at about 3,000 pounds. And you know, you put a couple hundred pounds into them. You can't put everything into that. Um, you know, some even below the 3,000 pound range. Uh, but ask the dealers, ask around to see what do you have in this floor plan that is a lot lighter. So you're going to give up carpet, you're going to give up, you know, you'll have some plastic in your cabinetry and stuff like that. That's the only way you can lighten that vehicle up. Chuck asked, just purchased a 2019 Shadow Toy hauler and the toilet does not flush. It seems like there might be a valve somewhere to supply the water to it. Any idea what could be wrong? Okay, well first of all, congratulations on your toy hauler. Have fun with that. Um, the way that the toilet works, and, and check out the videos um, on our site, we've got a lot of even free videos that kind of show the operation of that toilet. Um, it's either a Sealand, um, uh, Thedford and Dometic are the, the two that are kind of out in the market. But if it's a typical RV toilet, the, the way that uh, component works is on the lower side of the toilet base, you will have a pedal. And that pedal, you pull it up, and it's supposed to bring water in to help fill up the bowl with some water so you're not just using it dry. And then when you push it down, it actually opens a spade valve that allows everything to go down and water comes from underneath the rim. There's a series of, of little holes in there. On that valve, or on that, uh, that pedal, on the back side of the pedal is the water valve. So when you push it down, it literally lifts a plunger up that opens the water valve that's supposed to bring that up in the inside. First thing I would look at, you get back down, you might even have to take the shroud off the toilet um, to get to that valve, but chances are there is a water valve coming to that that's open, and a lot of those will have a shutoff there so that you don't freeze it up and do damage to the toilet. Um, if you don't have a leak, and just run all the water out and so forth. But check, check your lines going from that toilet to, or you know, from the the water pump to that. Also check, does it not flush when you're hooked to city water? and also the onboard water pump. And that'll kind of help identify where it's at. I, I would say you probably have a valve somewhere that's shut off in line. Okay, Michael asked, I need a, a stick on slide out seal, one and a half wide by three fourths thick on a super slide, Forest River, Salem, 2008. Camping World could not order it because it was out of stock. Any idea where else I might be able to find what I'm looking for? Well, first of all, I'd call Forest River and just ask them if they have a parts, um, you know, availability for that, and get a part number if you can. Um, I, I know there's a lot of uh, companies out there that provide all kinds of bulb seals, slide seals. One of them that comes to mind, and I'm, I'm I, I have a blank here right now. I think it's uh, RTP. Um, RTT rubber components, and I just I wish I, had, I wish I could Google search that right now. But in fact, I could, I can do that, can I? No, I don't have that hooked up. <laughs> but um, RTP is I think it's one of them. I would I would recommend call Forest River, tell them Camping World has got it, it's out of stock. Where do I get this? Can I get it from you? Can I get it from? They buy it from somebody. Um, RTP or somebody like like that. There is there are suppliers out there, and uh, that I would I would recommend giving them a call. Um, another thing you can do is is if you get a chance, go on Facebook or our social website and just post that question, and uh, we'll get it here and we can do some research and then be able to answer it to find out where where that's at. There is an RTP company. But... Is it RTP? Does it say? Um, rubber molding components? Global Compounder of Custom Engineered ther Thermoplastics? Uh, no, nope, that's not it. I wonder, give me one second here. I'm gonna, I don't wanna brush this off. Do you know where my glasses went? No, I don't have my glasses. Tell me what to, 
There we go. Let's just go one, two, three, four, five, six. Just rubber slide room components. That's a real tough one. I did. I gave my password away. Well, if you guys are ever in Maine, that should, that should throw them off, shouldn't it? Okay, where is... I hate to make everybody wait like this, but I think if I can do it real fast... Um, RV rubber seal. Amazon has a whole bunch of them, of course. PPL Motorhomes, that's another one down in Florida. They do an awful lot of um, parts for just about every component that's out there. And no, I do not see it right off the bat here. But I would say those two places and then, and then you know, try our, our, I keep thinking it's RTP. Uh, da, 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 something to products. Sorry, but uh, you know, PPL Motorhomes is a good one too. They have a ton of, of uh, parts that are all different kinds. They're not affiliated with any one brand, so they're able to get a lot of different stuff. Next question Purchased a used 1998 Jamboree GT 30 foot that has an outside entertainment setup. It has a small box to plug in aux. Etc. Mm -hmm. and TV if you have one. It says inside and outside speakers. I don't know how to use any of it. Plus, I don't even know how to use the inside, the motorhome speakers. The radio in the cab doesn't seem to make them turn on. Is there somewhere I can find how to use the system? Hmm. Well, um, there is a video online on our website that we kind of go through an entertainment center. And uh, the way that one is set up is that you've got a roof antenna that gives you over-the-air feeds and you have an outside entertainment center and, and the aux uh, connection for that is typically designed for an exterior um, like a satellite dish. So you could hook up a satellite dish portable and it would run up into the inside into your entertainment center. Now, some of them will also have a um, uh, a cable. Some of them say uh, cable and um, satellite, so you can do you can do a cable system if your campground has it. A lot of them have just gone to the single coax connector on the outside of it, like you would see on the back of a TV, the little screw on. They call it an F connector um, that you would hook that up to. Now that goes up into the inside of the coach, and somewhere inside you're going to have an entertainment center as well. This is usually in an, an overhead compartment somewhere, and a motorhome would be up by the TV. And when you open that up, you'll see a box that typically says TV1, TV2, VCR, um, the, the variety of different combinations of those. TV1 is, is typically that first TV right in, that's why it's TV1, it's in that um, overhead compartment. And that should say um, antenna, aux, VCR, um, if it's an older system like that, what that's doing is that all those feeds come up. So your roof antenna comes into the back of that box. Your auxiliary comes up into the back of that box. Your VCR, your DVD comes into the back of that box. So all those feeds come in there. And so if you want to watch your TV on the roof antenna, you hit antenna. And that just connects that to your TV. Same thing with TV2, which is typically in the bedroom. Uh, if you have a TV that's outside in that entertainment center, it probably has TV3 or auxiliary TV or, or something like that. So you can change the feed from the roof antenna. If I want to watch the satellite dish feed, I hit the aux or the satellite. If I want to watch the VCR, I hit that on the, on the older units. Um, you know, the new units today, they typically have all the feeds coming into the TV, and you have to change the input. So your HDMI 1, your... HDMI 2 and so forth. But he, what year was that? He said it was a. It is a 1998 Jamboree. 98. GT. Yeah, so that would typically would have had the um, larger tube TV with kind of one input and that, that, that uh, and I can't even remember, Channel Master was a big one that was used for quite a few years. That 
switch box or an entertainment box. So that's that's kind of an overview of how that system should work. So I would just say kind of play with a, a little bit um, and just see if you've changed TVs and put a flat screen in there. Um, typically with the flat screen TVs, you're gonna have to go in and do a channel search first. So you put your antenna up and go to your menu and do a channel search. It has to find where those channels at and, and put it into your TV system. All right, I have a 2007 Jayco Seneca HD Coach. I would like to get a new mattress for the sofa fold-out. I've asking, I've asked uh, Camping World and other location how do I fit and get the right mattress. No one has been able to help me. Any ideas? I would uh, recommend contacting Brad and Hall, associates out of Elkhart. We just did an upgrade in a Winnebago Brave, a 2000, and we took the old jackknife sofa out of it, and we put in a, uh, it's the ultra leather, it's kind of the fake leather, but it's garment, really nice, beautiful stuff. And it has the fold out type, um, pull it up and fold it out bed, but then they also have this auxiliary air mattress that goes on the top of it and it is it's outstanding um, so I would I would recommend contacting them because if you've got a fold-out type what what type of bed did it say it was so far it was just a it just says uh, I would like to get a new mattress for the sofa fold-out fold-out so you got a very similar one it, you, you grab the handle bring it up and then you've got to pull it out so that that mattress needs to be able to bend fold over and, and go pretty flat. So most of the standard mattresses in those are going to be pretty thin and not very comfortable. That's why that air mattress has become very popular. And it's real simple. It just goes on the top and you plug in the pump and just pump it up. So Brad and Hall, uh, I don't have, the, I think it's bradandhall.com. But if you do a Google search uh, for that, it, it'll come up and great company to work with. And in fact, what I really like about Brad and Hall is when Working with them to upgrade this unit with all these different furniture components. We did drivers and passenger seats. We did uh, the sofa, the recliner. They spent, I don't know how many years, in 2008 when the industry kind of took a big dip, kind of took a big dip, uh, they went into actually installing this stuff to keep their factory workers and their people busy. So they've got hands on. They're not just selling furniture. They've done it. They knew exactly what the length is. That unit, when we talked about the slide room coming out, where that unit was positioned and the way the, the so, um, kitchen cabinetry was and the extension for the countertop, the guy knew exactly how long that unit was and that thing fits to the T. So I, I really liked working with him. Okay, so I Jerry asked, they say I should cover my class Super C 2008 Nexus Ghost. How to cover it with my solar panels because the RV is outside, not hooked up to electrical. The solar panels keep the charging system up, but if I cover the RV, will it still charge the batteries? Is there a company that can fit around the solar panels or do I have to strategically cut the cover? ADCO is probably the best one that's out there. They've been in ADCO is how they're spelled, and they have been in the business for uh, as long as I can remember. Um, I, I know we were using them at Winnebago, or the dealers were using them clear back in uh, 1989, 1990, and I, I still see them out in the market. Very reasonably priced, customized for um, a lot of applications. I don't know if they have this the, that option. But one of the things that you might want to do um, instead, when you put that cover on, it's not, you're not going to get a, a charge out of, you know, the, the sun will not hit those cells. But you might just want to get a, um, a portable panel. And a lot of companies like GoPower, uh, Zamp are making portable panels that are very inexpensive. And you put that cover on, you put the portable panel off to the outside and just hook it up to a, a, a port that you can put in that goes right to that controller because that's the, that's what you're looking to get at, the controller that'll go to your battery. So I would recommend contacting ADCO to see what they have and how they work with solar panel companies. Do they, do they have something that's customized or look at getting a portable? Okay. You don't need a big one, you know, because you're just trying to 
top those batteries off and keep them conditioned so it's not like you're running everything down and, and uh, need, a, need a lot. So. My 2018 Cedar Creek Hathaway isn't side to side level. Also, both Jensen TVs won't take a direct channel entry when I'm using cable. It's okay using the antenna, but Jensen says it's the cable, one cable system. I find that hard to believe. We're winter Texans and here for the winter. So the first question is, the unit isn't level side to side. Correct. Okay. So that's the first, and what kind of what kind of unit was it? 2018 Cedar Creek Hathaway. Okay, I guess the first thing I would I would look at is the leveling system because you need to be level, and I'm not sure how out of level you are because the the longer you use your refrigerator, if it's an absorption type refrigerator and you're out of level, uh, it's six degrees front to back, three degrees side to side, and it's critical that it's it's level so that fluid can get back down or liquid can get back down otherwise it's going to pool and it's going to flake and you're going to ruin your cooling unit. Um, probably not too far out of level but you know if you, if you can sleep in it and you're fairly comfortable but it is something I would definitely have a, a look at. Now typically um, most of your refrigerator manufacturers came out with a bubble level that is just a simple little level like this. This is what tells you if it's good. You put this right on the bottom of the freezer, that plate that's there, and that l bubble needs to be halfway in that circle. And that'll tell you that it front to back, side to, oops, side to side, that you're okay. So get one of these to tell you know exactly where it's at, but I would have a, a look at that um, leveling system just to make sure that you get that coach leveled. You also want to do that for your slide rooms. You start having an unlevel coach, and then your chassis is going to twist, and your sidewalls are going to twist, and you're running a room in a twisted sidewall, and you're just asking for problems. So the second portion of that question is your Jensen one cable. And I'm not familiar enough with, with that system, but I, I can't believe that if you're, if you're using it on an antenna, it works fine, but you're using it when you use it on the satellite dish. Both Jensen TVs won't take a direct channel entry when I'm using cable. It's okay using the antenna. The antenna. Okay. Um, and then it says Jensen says it's the cable one cable system. Okay. Mm. I would I would say that that's hard for me to believe as well because if it works from the antenna, why wouldn't it work from the cable feed? Because you're going in. To me, it's got to be something. Um, and, and I don't know what the question, do you get one TV that works or not? You know, I know in a, in a typical cable system that if you come in with the cable and, and you, um, you got a cable set-top box, but if it's a campground cable, it'd just be kind of a generic one. So I, I would say get, get in touch with a dealership that's familiar with that system. Um, I think Jensen's just kind of passing the buck. Um, not familiar enough with it. I, I don't know that system without being able to look at it. I think if I could get in and kind of trace the cables around and what, what, what are they actually going to. So when you're hooked to that cable system, find out what that goes to to supply to your TV. You know, is it, a, is it an issue with the switching system, which you, you typically have to have something like that, and what kind of cable are you using? Joe asked, any recommendations for satellite internet service? Is there one I can use while we're on the move? Um, you know, I, I would, I know DISH has got some stuff. Um, I, I think one of the, probably one of the best receivers out in the market is, is WineGuard. Uh, I know both DISH and WineGuard um, have, um, or DISH and Direct, and WineGuard supplies both of them, um, but I, we have done quite a few uh, programs with in-motion satellite dishes that WineGuard has. Uh, I would recommend going to their site and take a looking at it, and they do have programs that are available through DISH. Now they also have, you, you may not want to go with a internet um, or a satellite internet system, you may want to go with just a 4G. WineGuard has a couple different options through their satellite dish and also what they call their Connect One, which is just a, 
um, a small dome that's put on the top of the unit and it, it is a Wi-Fi enhancer so if the campground has one you can get it but it's also got a 4G program that when you're traveling anywhere in the country um, and even while you're traveling you can get internet connection and um, you can pay for it by the month so if, if you're not using it every single month it's very reasonable when you compare it to like I use a Verizon hotspot and I think I pay $60 every two months for the Verizon hotspot. And, uh, you know, it, and that seems to work very well, but the WineGuard one, that doesn't, um, my Verizon one doesn't enhance an existing one anywhere. It always goes through this one, and I only have so much data I can bring through it, where the WineGuard one, um, you know, it's unlimited. And it's great speeds, so I, I would, you know, venture to say maybe you want to go that direction versus uh, satellite internet. Greg asked, having an issue with my 2016 Glacier Peak LP heater, it starts through the cycle, lights off, and then goes out after a couple of seconds and will cycle through this three times, then shuts down. There has been a couple of times it has lit off, but has gone out after maybe four or five minutes, then shuts down. Where can I start to troubleshoot? Um, well, the first thing I would recommend is um, take a look at some of the videos that we have on online. We've done quite a bit of extensive furnace troubleshooting and uh, maintenance, and then we've also uh, done a complete class. But here's how the furnace works. So the first thing that happens is your thermostat calls for heat. It's cold inside, calls for heat, so it closes the circuit, sends it down to the gas valve, and, or to the, the, the furnace. First thing the furnace thing is going to do is it's going to turn on the blower motor. And what that does is it, it exhausts any LP that might be in the chamber, stale air, stuff like that. And it gets going with just that. And it also is going to raise what's called a sail switch on the opposite side of the blower motor. And what the sail switch will do is, is it's saying, hey, I've got enough airflow. I don't have anything blocking inside components and so you'll hear a click and then you'll hear a light and that's the the piezo spark igniter and then the flame will light and then there's two things after that that can make it do what you're talking about the first one is if it doesn't sense a flame in the thermocoupler that thermocoupler acts as a it's just a um, a closed circuit basically and it, it goes for a certain amount of time and it says uh oh I don't sense a flame touching me here then I'm opening I've got my gas valve open but yet I'm letting I have no flame so I'm letting raw gas go into the unit so it could be your thermocoupler is is dirty uh, some people call it a flame sensor um, that'll do the same thing it'll try it about three times and then it'll go out it just says up oh, failed usually there's some kind of a code that, that blinks down in the furnace depending on what kind you have the second thing is the high temperature switch on the back side. There, on the back side of the burner assembly, there's a temperature sensor that if it gets to a certain high temperature, it's saying, uh-oh, something's wrong. Usually there is an issue with the airflow inside. Maybe there was just enough air to bring the sail switch up, but if you've got any of your outlets inside closed or your, your vents closed or um, stuff over top of them and this is a common problem people like to put the rugs and the runners and all the stuff to make it comfy and not ruin their carpet inside but then they they cover their vents and if you get just enough vents covered inside where you don't get a good exhausting airflow or you don't get the cool air to come back in from the cool air exchange then that temperature keeps rising and rising and rising and gets up and says oh shut me down so that's how the system works those are the two things that are typically going to cause that, that issue. Matt asked... Um, oh, and by the way, both of those pretty much require you pulling the furnace out. My Onin QD generator has been serviced recently. Now it only runs about 10 seconds before it dies and gives me a double flash message, which means it has a low oil pressure sensor. Is it normal for the oil pressure sensor to go bad? It's not normal. Um, make sure you ch check your oil in it. Um, you know, I have seen cases where people have they, they've changed the oil in it, and they didn't put enough oil back in the inside of it. Um, 
something else that it, it could possibly be, check the filter. If they, number one, hopefully they put a new filter on, but I have seen where they haven't, they forgot about the filter and it's the old filter and it doesn't have, it, it's dirty, it's t dirty to the point where it won't allow enough air, uh, oil flow to go through it and then the sensor says, ooh, got low oil because I'm not getting enough flow coming through it. Um, the second thing is, is if it doesn't have enough oil or they've got the wrong kind of oil um, or they, they put the wrong filter, um, I, I always recommend putting an Onan filter in an Onan generator. It's got the right number of filaments in it, the right paper that's used in it. A lot of these cheap knockoffs are, are just, they're, they're not good, and these are getting so much more sensitive. So make sure it's got the, the right Onan OEM filter in it, that it's a new filter. Check your oil level, um, and just make sure that it, it's topped off to the point it should be, and that if all that's okay, um, then it's probably a sensor. I just think it's ironic that you just get the oil changed and then the oil sensor goes bad. So it, it just kind of seems to be that something may be a little different. Next question. I have a 2005 Coachman Concord with slide. When opening slide, I have to manually push the open slide with motor running. It keeps stopping unless I push the unit open or close. Do you think I need to replace the motor? Um, well, the, the first thing I would check is your battery. That, that sounds t like a typical battery that um, has gotten sulfated and it doesn't have enough storage capacity and it just doesn't have enough oomph to put that in there. The, you know, the first thing I would look at is are you plugged in when you do it? If you're plugged in, you're getting some power from this converter here, but not totally. I would then go maybe get a battery pack, uh, just one of the booster jumpers or a battery charger put it on your battery, give it that little extra oomph and see if that makes a difference. If not, then you probably, I, I would go, and, and, I, and I get back to the fact with any vehicle that has a slide room, I highly recommend that you level the coach and stabilize it before you ever try to bring a slide room out. And I, I know there's some manufacturers and dealers that are telling people to bring the slide room out first and then level it. I have no clue why they're telling people that. When I worked at Winnebago Industries, we spent over 14,000 extensions and retractions to see what would happen with the chassis, the slide rooms, foundations, all that stuff. And what we found is that if you have a coach that is out of level and is not secure, that chassis is going to twist. Everybody thinks these chassis are these heavy, massive steel beams that don't ever do anything. They will bend and twist like you would not believe. And so you've got a, a unit that's out of level or is not stabilized, and you're starting to move something, that, that chassis is going to be twisted. That sidewall is going to twist. And that room is going to be binding against everything. And some of those motors that are, are not 100% new can't take that. And the same with the battery. So level the coach, stabilize it first, see if that makes a difference. Check your batteries by putting a, a, a charger or some kind of booster on it, see if that makes a difference. Then, um, you know, and also I would recommend making sure that everything's lubed very well. There's a lot of slide room lubrication. Thetford has some, uh, so none of that is binding. Nothing's in the way. Um, take a look underneath. Make sure all your openings around are, um, are good. I've seen times where there's just enough stuff underneath to kind of bind a little bit as it goes in and out. Um, then the last thing would be your motor. And you can typically test that motor by just doing an amp draw. You know, bring that room, the room out. Um, you should say right on the motor what it's, what it's drawing for amps. And if it's getting up real high, then, then you know your motor is, is going bad. But that's kind of the last step. I'm looking to get an older Flagstaff 25D travel trailer. What are the components that weigh the most on that unit that I could look at reducing? such as a queen mattress, maybe replace that mattress with, with an inflatable queen mattress. Also has a full-size couch that I may try inflatables so that I can tow it. There, there are, uh, you know, some of the stuff you can do is um, cabinet doors weigh a lot. I've seen a lot of people take the cabinet doors out and put a, a thinner uh, type of a plastic cabinet door or take them out completely, different refrigerators. Smaller refrigerators, the sofa is, is a big item. You can take that sofa out and put in 
um, you know, a couple of chairs that are, are a little more, um, we call it European, but they're, they're a little plastic and, and, and they're um, thinner materials. Um, carpet and pad, take uh, carpet and pad out and, and uh, put vinyl in. That'll save some weight. Uh, the big thing is, is, is uh, we talked about this before, somebody talked about taking water. Don't take water down the road. You know, find out, and, and what I would say, go weigh that coach first. Take it to a CAT scale. Um, your Flying J's, Pilots, Bosselmans all have a CAT scale. If you go to catscale.com, that's C-A-T-S-C-A-L-E.com, uh, you'll find a CAT scale in your area for 10 bucks. Find out what that coach weighs as it sits there. I think you might be surprised. And then don't put water in it. Water's 8.3 pounds per gallon. So you can, you know, just look at the, the components inside and find out what do I need. Um, get you right with the queen bed. One of the things you can do is take that mattress out and put an inflatable mattress so you take all the air out when you travel. Once you get to the campground, you can put anything you want in it. You just can't travel down the road and expect to stop and not wear out components with it. So... There are some things you can do to lighten that up. Okay, this is from Dan. Grand Design Reflection 30BH. On the roof of the trailer, there is only a small vent, approximately five inches round. I have problems with the fridge heating up. Can I replace it with the larger size vent like we all have seen on top of the trailers? On top of trailers. If so, what is your opinion about the solar powered exhaust vent? Good, no good, indifferent. Well, I, I, I don't think that round five-inch vent is the refrigerator vent. Um, most of those are going to be a long flue with the plastic one like you're talking about. I, I would say that your, the grand design that you have, if that refrigerator is in the slide room, the vent's on the side of the unit. It's not, it's not going to be on the top because your slide room is going to go in and out and you're not going to vent you know, through that roof of the slide room and then try to get it through the roof of the coach. Um, you know, I, I may be wrong if one of the things I found in, in the RV industry is I never say never, but I doubt that five inch one uh, is, is there because both Dometic and Norcold have a larger vent um, in those. So look at that side thing. If you're, and he is having problems with the, the overheating, what was the problem he was having with the? I have problems with the fridge heating up. Heating up, okay. Um, Probably what you want to do instead is take a look at some auxiliary fans that would go above the um, cooling unit, above the condenser fins, and help exhaust that fan up there. The, and I would also get in and just look behind that refrigerator. What's up in there? Um, take an um, um, air compressor and an air gun, put on some safety glasses, just get in and clean all those coils off from, you should have a vent on the back side of the refrigerator that you can pull off and just get in there and clean everything, get all the dust and everything and, and see if you can look up there and, and, and find out. But I, I, I doubt very much that vent at the top. I think it's more of a sewer vent for your, um, um, your drainage vent for your wastewater system that, uh, is allowing water to get in or air to get in so you don't have a vacuum. All right. Uh, this person asks When I got my 2007 Jayco Seneca HD, it didn't have manual for the engine with it. Where can I get one? I need to know what the engine lights mean and what the manual says about the engine itself. Um, so you probably, with the Jayco Seneca, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what brand that is, if it's a Sterling or um, some of those they use the, the larger semi-type uh, components. I would start by, by contacting Jayco and in the, you know, the other thing is, is find out exactly what model um, that your chassis is, that front cab area chassis, and, and then um, contact Jayco and just ask them who they recommend. Almost every dealer has somebody that they've partnered with in those chassis because most of your RV dealerships can't work on the chassis. You know, they haven't been able to for many, many years. So you have to take it to a Chevy dealer or a Ford dealer or a, um, uh, in, in these cases, like Sterling or Volvo uh, or some of the bigger ones like that. So who do they have that they're working with 
to do the repairs, then they should be able to find uh, the owner's manual for you. Now, now some manufacturers like Winnebago, they do keep copies of the chassis manufacturers on file so that they can send those to you. But I, I would start by contacting them. Stan asked, I have a 2017 Cougar fifth wheel. What do I need to do to winter camp in Colorado? Not sure if I can use water systems, etc. when it gets down to 20 or so, teens or zero. Okay. Well, and when we opened this up, I was talking about the blogs we just put together for CoachNet. So I would recommend that uh, if you get a chance to go on CoachNet's site, you don't even have to be a member. You can go into their website and look at their CoachNet connection. It's called um, newsletter that comes out and go, go through the latest archives in it. But the first thing um, I would recommend is to get some kind of a supplemental heating system. Uh, you can use the, the fresh water. Most people, what I've seen, what they do is they, they, they'll fill the fresh water tank up for a short period of time and then disconnect their hose. But if you want to keep the hose connected to the outside, there is a um, product now called Pirate. And it is, I think, P-I-R-I-T. And it is a heated freshwater hose. So it, it'll hook to it, and then it's got a heat element that, it, that keeps that from freezing coming up to it. Um, you also want to make sure you put some type of supplemental heat, whether it's a heat blanket or, um, you know, what I've done, if, if you have access to 120 volt, put an outlet down in your service center where you have your freshwater tank. Now, now, I'm not so worried about the wastewater systems. I put a, 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 a couple gallons of antifreeze down those, and that keeps them from freezing up. I don't want the valves and stuff to freeze um, in the bottom of it. I, I would not recommend keeping the hose hooked up permanently because that hose is corrugated, and you're going to get a lot of frozen waste in that, in, in that hose. You know, get it. When you dump, rinse it out really good. Um, you know, find a way to to uh, dry it out and then store it in a heated compartment somewhere if you can. Um, the other thing is skirt or way, all the way around the bottom um, of the rig. You know, you can have um, you take a unit and put it out into 32, 33 degree weather. And if you get a good hard wind that comes in underneath that and hits those lines and hits the freshwater lines and everything, you could freeze it up. You could drop the temperature 20 degrees just by wind chill uh, of that coming in. So if you can skirt this around, um, there's a lot of companies that make a customized skirt that can just snap in. Even just piling up some snow around it create a barrier so that wind can't get in or bales of hay or you know whatever you can to keep it. Uh, the skirts look a, a lot nicer in it. Um, you know, then inside, just check and make sure you know, you understand where your water system is at. Um, and getting back, I didn't finish that. The, in the service center, what I've done in the past is I put a, uh, an outlet in the service center and then I hook one of those small little ceramic heaters into that area um, and just help supplement that heat, put it on a real low setting and just kind of keep it, keep it running. Inside, um, couple things that you want to look at. Here's one right here. This is what's called a catalytic heater and it just runs off the small little propane bottles that you can get uh, just about anywhere and it will heat this up and it's one of the safest heaters out in the market. You, do, you get uh, very little condensation inside from these heaters plus you get uh, virtually no carbon monoxide that's one of the issues that you get for sometimes from open flame stuff. I don't like the ceramic heaters inside. They draw a ton of, of uh, juice, first of all. You have to stay about three feet away from those. This one you can get very close up to it. Uh, this one happens to be a heat, uh, is it Mr. Heater? Yeah, Mr. Heater Portable Buddy. There is Campco has one, the Olympian. Um, they, they all kind of work on the same, the same premise. There are even, You'll see little tabs on the back side here. I've seen where people will permanently mount these and run a line from um, an LP source inside in here rather than just using the canisters. It gives you a nice supplemental heat. It draws no battery power. So if you do any kind of dry camping, you don't have to worry about that heater uh, inside your coach. But these are great supplemental things to have. Another thing you can do this happens to be a product called Reflectix, and 
and it is a great insulator. Um, you put this in the windows, so insulate all those windows inside. You could also use these if you don't have dual pane windows, or even if you do, just to add a little additional layer in there to give it some um, some insulation and, and an air barrier. Is just that you know it's the, it's the plastic stuff that you put on, you heat up like you would in your old older homes, and just kind of get it ready get it ready for winter. Um, the other thing that you want to do too is with your refrigerator, you want to make sure that you park in a, in a manner that your, your refrigerator is protected from a good hard wind coming in the side. Because if it gets really, really cold, that uh, solution inside that refrigerator can actually gel up and, and not work. So you don't, want to, you don't want to have too much of that wind blowing into that refrigerator and, and uh, you know, cooling it down. So there are some things you can do. Check out the Coach Nut blog. There's a lot more stuff that we talk about um, in there and you know again as far as the sewage system is not a whole lot you need to do you may want to get a bigger LP tank um, you know instead of the, and I'm sure what what kind of vehicle was it? It is a 2017 Cougar fifth wheel. Fifth wheel so you probably have two 40 pound tanks in that so you probably have enough of that but if you're going to do any dry camping in the winter time you know mean, meaning you're not plugged in I would definitely look at a lot more battery power. So that's all for questions. We have three minutes. Three minutes. Okay. Well, um, I guess the uh, we talked a little bit about the, the, the winterizing that, that we did. And that Brad and Hall is dot com, two B's. Okay, yeah, Brad and Hall is B R A D D A N D H A L L. Hall.com, and again, a great, great company to work with. Um, the project that we worked on is we replaced the carpeting in a 2002 Winnebago Brave, and put in Infinity woven fabric. Um, it's a high-end luxury fabric, and looks beautiful. We they decided the owners decided then to upgrade the um, couch, and the dinette, and the uh, lounge chair inside in the driver's and passenger seat. Um, one of the things you want to look at if, if you're looking at maybe um, changing the, the carpeting or any kind of flooring in your RV, if you've got a slide room, you've got to make sure whatever you get can withstand that slide and whatever mechanism. Now, Winnebago happens to use a, on this one it was a hydraulic slide, HWH, had the two rams that hooked towards the outside, putting the room in and out. And they have a shoe, they call it, and it's just a long bar with a plastic runner that runs in kind of a U-shape and that just glides along what was the, the carpet. And you know when you put carpet in there, you can staple it down and you don't see any of those staples. When you put this vinyl down, you can't staple it. And so we were kind of concerned, excuse me, concerned about it sliding on this vinyl back and forth. So we had to glue it in all those areas where we were gonna have the bedroom slide and the couch and dinette slide um, on the front of it. The other consideration that we found out kind of afterwards is you got to get it underneath the slide, and I shouldn't say afterwards, during this process. And, and we started from the inside where we um, lifted the slide room up and put a two by four under it. We brought the slide room out to about four inches, um, left it not all the way to the edge. And uh, we lifted that up where we could go from the outside and lift the room up we found out afterwards and get access to underneath it so big thing with if you're going to replace the carpet make sure you get something that it could slide across um, if you want to put wood flooring it's got to be interlocking wood flooring at least seven mil because it's got to float that stuff is going to heave as you go down the road and you get temperature changes so i'm getting the wrap-up sign here i appreciate all the questions um, everybody coming out tonight i think we've fixed our little glitch with our our internet connection and everything and hopefully the audio was great and if we could have some really good talent sometime this would be a wonderful program I'm dissing myself here so keep those questions coming I know everybody's got a lot of stuff uh, you know that the spring will be here before we know it I hope uh, but um, and those of you that have your unit in storage make sure you get out about once or twice during the storage period run that generator get that varnish out of there 
and charge up your battery so you don't get sulfation. With that, have a great Christmas, Happy New Year, and again, thanks for coming out. And he's going, dun, 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 dun. make that face again. Play with my truck, my 